Hi, I'm Gabe Lyon, Executive Director of Illinois Humanities. We activate the humanities through free public programs, grants, and educational opportunities designed to foster reflection, spark conversation, build community, and strengthen our state's civic engagement. I really want to thank you for joining us tonight for People, Places, and Power, Cook County Edition. The content for this program has been pre-recorded, but we're premiering it live. So I really hope you'll share your questions and comments in the chat. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. Some of you realize that this is the third of three programs in which we're considering the relationship amongst population distribution, the allocation of political power and public resources from the vantage point of places in our state where that relationship is really significant. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited to be right here introducing the program. I'm in the Cook County Forest Preserves at the Chicago Portage National Historic Site. It's, it's really a very beautiful and somewhat unassuming place, but it's a place with great historic significance. This is the place where the low short divide between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River became one of the most important travel routes across the middle of our continent during European experience. Expansion. Tonight we're visiting Cook County and of the 102 counties in Illinois, this is the county with the largest population and the highest population density. In one evening, of course, we can hardly talk about all of the ways in which power, population, and place are interrelated, but we are going to try to highlight a few ways in which this county has been shaped by its geography and the ways people have shaped what this geography has become over time. I'll give you a couple of highlights of what you're going to see. We're going to hear from Tanika Johnson and her incredibly insightful folded, folded map project, which gives us a way of looking at and understanding the impacts of segregation in Chicago, but also around the state. Laura Washington is going to moderate an amazing conversation amongst elected officials who represent urban, rural, and suburban constituencies. And those are representatives who all have a stake in Illinois' second congressional district. Some journalists are going to have a conversation that we'll get to listen in on about some of the current events that are unfolding as we speak tonight. And our wonderful program manager for statewide engagement, Matt Meacham, is going to share three cultural interludes that really highlight the way the fabric of Illinois is connected to Cook County and Cook County is connected to the rest of Illinois. But first and foremost, we're going to take a look at the age old question, how did we get here in the first place? Hi, I'm Dennis McClendon, Chicago geographer and historian, and I want to take a few minutes to talk about why is Chicago there? If you study a map of North America, you'll see a certain geographic inevitability to Chicago. The long finger of Lake Michigan ends here in the middle of the continent and the rich prairie farmland. Not only that, but as the French explorer Father Marquette discovered in 1673, it's only a few miles of easy portage across the prairie to a navigable river that eventually flows into the Mississippi and a short canal would even eliminate the portage. Marquette was the guest of the Illini and Potawatomi Indian tribes, but he was followed by others, and a century later, Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, a mixed-race black man, established a trading post on the north bank of the river. The importance of this site to trade was soon clear, and in 1803, the United States affirmed its dominance over the Chicago portage, and this part of the continent by building Fort Dearborn here. In 1825, the Erie Canal connected the Great Lakes region to East Coast ports, and by 1833, the place was booming. The village of Chicago was incorporated, population 350, and the Indians were sent west of the Mississippi River, the government having paid them off in cash. Everyone knew that a canal would do wonders for the region, and so in 1830, the state's Canal Commission laid out the route and to pay for the work began selling off lots on the, in the towns at either end, Ottawa and Chicago. They finally started digging in 1836, and what looked like soft prairie turned out to be solid limestone, and they kept running out of money and didn't finish until 1848. Not a moment too soon, the first railroad reached town the same year, so did the first ship to come all the way from the Atlantic. 
Suddenly, Chicago was the hub of the region. The boats came from the east to the tip of the lake, and the trains, by 1856, ten railroads ran into Chicago, came from the rich farmland in Illinois and Iowa and Wisconsin to the same place. Here was a complex of wharves and warehouses and railroad tracks to transfer the farm products going east and the merchandise coming west. Thus, Chicago became one of the world's great entrepots. That's your vocabulary word for the day. It means a place where goods transfer between transportation modes, in Chicago's case, from Great Lakes boats to river barges or railroad cars. Because the stuff is already being unloaded and reloaded, such places are a terrific place to add value by processing, by assembling, by repacking. Chicago soon was funneling farm products, particularly grain and meat, to the cities of the East and even to Europe. The manufactured goods, including other more exotic foods, coffee, sugar, spices, were being shipped West. Wholesale houses broke down big shipments into small orders to supply grocers and general stores all across the Middle West. Peaches, strawberries, vegetables came from Union County and southernmost Illinois and other places with early springs. Lumber cut in the north woods of Wisconsin and Michigan came to Chicago and was turned into doors, windows, millwork, even entire buildings ready to send by train to the treeless prairies out west. Southern Illinois coal heated the city's boilers and powered its locomotives. By the Civil War, the young city was one of the nation's great supply centers. The Union Stockyards, opened in 1865, consolidated much of the nation's meatpacking, and the new Transcontinental Railroad connected Chicago to the wide open west, to California, and on to the Pacific. By the time of the Great Fire in 1871, the city was unstoppable. The completely destroyed business district was quickly rebuilt even bigger. Because Chicago was such a young city, railroads had no trouble pushing right to its center along the banks of the Chicago River. Ironically, that girdle of iron pushed Chicago to build tall downtown office buildings even as the expanse of flat farmland stretching to the horizon enabled a new kind of city, one of single-family homes, many owned by the workers who lived there. Factories destroyed by the fire rebuilt bigger facilities on the city's outskirts. So did new industries set up to make steel, to build railroad cars, to process corn products. In Chicago, Montgomery Ward and Sears Roebuck invented mail-order stores, even turning shopping for clothes, tools, or housewares into industrial-scale enterprises. The Midwestern grid of small rectangular farms transformed bit by bit into the urban fabric of Chicago, a relentless grid of wide streets supported on a framework of rail lines, relieved here and there by parks, boulevards, and unappreciated for a long time by the lakeshore. This growing economic powerhouse needed labor, of course. Various crises in Europe, failed revolution in Germany, the potato famine in Ireland, pushed immigrants to leave for the New World, and Chicago was hiring. The Germans, often educated or having skilled trades, came to dominate the city's cultural institutions. The Irish, who arrived already speaking English, came to dominate its politics. Scandinavians, Dutch, Italian, Greek, Polish, Bohemian, Ukrainian, Lithuanian immigrants also arrived in big numbers. Most soon found work in Chicago's factories, killing floors, railroads, construction sites. In the 20th century, additional groups of immigrants arrived, Mexicans to work in the steel mills, and African Americans seeking opportunity as well as escape from the degrading social conditions of the Jim Crow era South. Employers cynically pitted ethnic groups against each other, recruiting the newest immigrants as strike breakers or to work for lower wages. But the labor movement also had important successes in Chicago that brought better working conditions, higher pay, the eight-hour day. As the 20th century began, 
Chicago looked hard at itself. The young city muscled its way onto the world stage with the 1893 World's Fair, which attracted millions to see the elegantly composed fairgrounds and the neoclassical pavilions. But outside the gates of the exposition was a city with serious problems. Burnham and Bennett's 1909 Plan of Chicago and similar studies inspired the city to begin desperately needed improvements. The flow of the river was reversed to reduce pollution and disease. Steam railroads were elevated to reduce accidents. Part of the river was moved to untangle streets and railroads. But social issues were not so easily or readily tackled. Safe, sanitary housing was a serious problem for Chicago's poor workers and their families. In many neighborhoods, ethnic suspicions and tension over employment issues flared into racial animosity most pronounced toward the city's latest arrivals, blacks and Latinos. By 1914, poet Carl Sandburg described the pulsating city as hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads in the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. But in the same poem, he could write of his adopted home as brutal, with the words, On the faces of women and children I have seen the marks of wanton hunger. Chicago was hard hit by the Great Depression. Factories shut down, railroad tracks went quiet, unemployment and suffering was widespread. Among the few bright spots were public works projects, like the city's new subway or modern Lakeshore Drive. Chicago rebounded and strengthened as a manufacturing center during World War II, with huge new plants building the machines of war. Engines for tanks, torpedoes, radar, bomb sites, cargo planes. The city's manufacturing dominance expanded in the 1950s to small appliances and electronics. After the war, widespread auto ownership and federal programs to encourage home ownership allowed the city and suburbs to spread out miles from the commuter train stations that had been the nucleus of Chicago's suburbs, all across the cornfields of Cook and DuPage County. A map of built-up areas that had once looked like beads on a string now filled in the farmland in between the railroad lines. In the 1950s, Chicago, with federal help, finally began to address its housing problems. Feeling a big problem required a big solution, city planners used urban renewal tools to clear some of the nation's most shameful slums and build public housing. When political considerations forced the Chicago Housing Authority to concentrate new units in high-rises, nearly all of them sited in the traditional Black Belt, the new housing projects themselves eventually became disappointing concentrations of poverty and crime. Those were demolished in the early 2000s, again displacing poor Chicago families. In the computer age, research shifted the nation's economic focus to the east and west coasts. Lower wages in Mexico, China, lured away much of Chicago's manufacturing. The Calumet region steel mills couldn't compete with more modern facilities elsewhere or ones overseas propped up by national governments. Chicago still has enormous transportation advantages. After all, it's still right where it's always been. But for low-skill or labor-intensive manufacturing, that factor can't overcome the lower costs of manufacturing overseas. Chicago has settled into its middle age as a city with less swagger, a diversified economy of finance, knowledge industries, services, along with food processing, logistics, and skilled manufacturing. Lacking breathtaking scenery, Chicago has created some to lure the footloose entrepreneurs of the 21st century. This transition has built a glittering downtown, but left decaying neighborhoods next to shuttered factories. Chicago continues to reinvent itself, particularly in the central city, but its decades of rapid growth and complete transformation are past. 
from the edge of downtown out to farm fields on the horizon. Chicago can seem like a tightly woven fabric of cozy houses, of cohesive neighborhoods, of tidy towns. But a closer look will reveal the inequality found within that fabric. This map is what Chicago's segregation looks like. The pink purplish that you see on this map and the others that you'll see later represent the neighborhoods that are predominantly white. The blue that you see represents the neighborhoods that are predominantly black. The orange that you see are neighborhoods that are predominantly Latino. And the neon green that you see in the center and speckled throughout the top are the neighborhoods that are Asian. Chicago is consistently one of the most segregated metropolitan areas in the nation, only declining slightly since housing discrimination was made illegal in the 1968 Fair Housing Act. And segregation isn't just a Chicago issue. It exists throughout all of Illinois. In Peoria, segregation looks like this. In Rockford, segregation looks like this. And in Springfield, it looks like this. Racial segregation is nationwide. The foundation of segregation was laid by redlining and many other discriminatory local, state, and federal housing policies and practices over time. These efforts prevented investment in schools, shops, banks, community spaces, and a host of other resources in black neighborhoods. And it also set the stage for exploitative real estate practices, such as land sale contracts. Mix in the behaviors of white residents who greeted potential new black neighbors with either violent protests or simply by fleeing, segregation and the racial inequities it perpetuated became intentionally cemented into Chicago's landscape. Folded Map connects residents what I call map twins, at corresponding addresses on opposite sides of Chicago. Through this, I unpack residential segregation, both by showing people what it looks like and revealing how it impacts residents and our lived experiences. The photographs illustrate the disparities and the conversations between the map twins reveal what life is like on opposite ends of the same street. seeing a theater um, from Olin Alley. Um, maybe um, some type of center for the youth to kind of go hang out at or have some, some things to do when they get out of school um, or to be able to be exposed to different artistic options to um, just, just kind of give them something to do. Um, aside kind of like hanging outside and finding different ways or, or getting into trouble um, or that, those trouble even being an option because if you have nothing to do of course it's like there's trouble rating right over there so yeah <laughs> those are some good suggestions yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know <laughs> what are we yeah a lot, of, a lot of our needs are are met here there's yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure we could think of something, but uh, yeah. The meetings between Map Twins forge connections and create reflections and insights into one's own situation and that of others in a segregated Chicago. And they make segregation personal 
because until we make it personal, we'll never break it down. That was like a genuine connection, right? It was like nothing forced or fake. We had a conversation, um, learned each other's differences in the community. Um, the things that I talked about or maybe spoke about that I would like to see here in Inglewood, they already had out there. When we spoke, to know that they couldn't even imagine being in the community, not having the things that, I guess, basic necessity. So, yeah, it was interesting. I guess it is, it is really striking, uh, you know, how lucky we are. And we certainly don't think of ourselves as living in a rich neighborhood, but compared to some, we, we are very privileged, you know. Folded Map began simply as an art project, but it has become my way of combating social injustice. Ultimately, I want Folded Map to help us heal and get to know each other so that we can tear down the racist walls that divide us. And to do this, we have created the Folded Map Action Kit. The Folded Map Action Kit allows us to explore our own stories and understand how larger social structures impact the details of them. How has your social networks and lived experiences shaped your opinions and impacted your actions? How has the media informed your perceptions? The goal of unpacking these stories is not to place blame. It is to work to identify ways to break the cycle, individually and collectively, to identify how we have all been impacted by segregation. So what can we do? One way is to educate ourselves about places that our social networks, lived experiences, and the media have kept off our radars or have just created biased perceptions of. This is the goal of the Action Kit. It invites you to create your own story about a neighborhood, read the stories of our neighborhood guides, and learn about and visit a twin neighborhood, not as a tourist, but as if you are a resident. Try to find an ATM to take out $20. Find a store where you can buy lotion. Check out the local library or even the bus stop and then share your story with others. Segregation means that power and resources are segregated. Residential segregation is a tool for oppression because resources are routinely distributed based on space. So even though Folded Map focuses on the city of Chicago, residential segregation exists between the suburbs and the city, within suburbs throughout Cook County, across the entire Chicago metropolitan area, and in towns and communities throughout Illinois. So this idea can travel almost anywhere and unpacking the lessons of power, place, and resources can start by making segregation personal in your community. Our thanks to Tanika Johnson, Maria Creason, and animator Color Everywhere for illustrating how racial residential segregation relates to the intersection of people, places, and power in Cook County and many other Illinois communities. Cook County and other regions of Illinois are connected in many ways as our three cultural interludes will demonstrate. The first features saxophonist A.C. Reed. Born Aaron Corthen in the Southeast Missouri Boot Heel in 1926, he lived most of his childhood and teenage years in Pulaski County in southernmost Illinois, as well as in Carbondale. He moved to Chicago where he worked in a steel mill, 
honed his musical talent, and eventually made distinctive contributions to the city's thriving blues tradition. Here's music historian Bill Dahl. AC was a well, rarity on the Chicago blues scene. There were only a handful of sax players that also sang. I can only think of him and Eddie Shaw that led their own bands and everything and did what uh, harp players and guitar players normally do in Chicago. His formative years seem to have been pretty much in southern Illinois. And then he moved up here to Chicago in the late 40s and got to know Gene Ammons and J.T. Brown and sax players like that and went to the Chicago Conservatory of Music. He was a very meat and potatoes kind of player. Nothing fancy about him whatsoever. Just play, you know, gutsy, right in your face, blues licks. Earl Hooker had a lot to do with him getting his feet wet in bands in Chicago and downstate as well. Great guitar player. We don't want to forget, too, the uh, Dennis Binder period there. He joined Binder out of Chicago in the mid-50s, and they used Lawton, Oklahoma as their home base for like four years. They played in an all-white club in Lawton, Oklahoma, which was a big army town. A.C. always claimed that Buddy Holly wanted him to be on some of his records. A.C. claims in my interview that racism kind of uh, screwed that up. Quite a bit of question as to whether he was related to Jimmy Reed or not. He claimed that Jimmy Reed told him that they were half-brothers. He certainly did adopt a Jimmy Reed-style vocal delivery, real laid-back, and he liked those laid-back shuffles, like this little voice. She's Fine became his big uh, signature tune in the mid-60s, and that was very, you could have mistaken that for Jimmy Reed. There were a couple of nice singles in the mid-60s, My Buddy Buddy Friends, and one called I'd Rather Fight Than Switch. On the other side, I Got Money to Burn. They were kind of a little funkier kind of thing. There was a period there during the 60s when he played with Buddy Guy quite a bit, when Buddy was first breaking into the big time. Those are probably the earliest film clips of AC. He was always trying, you know, to make that breakthrough. It took till the mid to late 70s before he did. He was playing with Sun Seals. He could have stayed with Sun or went with Albert Collins, and he thought the better opportunity was to go with Albert. That was the first edition of the Icebreakers. Great, great band. Best blues band I've ever seen, actually, as far as putting out the grooves. That was really when people got hip to him, as far as more than just the cognoscenti around Chicago. There's those albums at the end that he produced himself for his own Ice Cube label. You know, I'm fed up with this music. His whole thing toward the end was like a blues curmudgeon, where he'd, and it was, it was all tongue-in-cheek. He'd laugh when he sang them on stage. You know, if he came along now, of course, he'd be like a superstar because he was the real deal, and we don't have many real deal guys anymore, but in those days, he was just one of those working blues men that you kind of took for granted that he'd always be around. A.C. Reed's musical and lyrical creativity, as well as his pseudo-curmudgeonly wit, are readily apparent in this original composition, the title track from his 1987 Alligator album, I'm in the Wrong Business. I'm in the wrong business And made that movie Rocket 3. I would be a star like Sylvester Mr. T. Should have been like Michael Jackson when I was the age of five. But I choose this saxophone now. I'm broke and I can't survive. I'm in the wrong business. Like A.C. Reed's life story, Illinois' 2nd Congressional District spans a large swath of our state's territory and encompasses many different kinds of communities. It extends from Chicago's southeasternmost neighborhoods through south suburban Cook and Will counties all the way to the small towns and farmland of southwestern Kankakee County. Here with their thoughts on the challenges and benefits of living in a congressional district with a wide variety of urban, suburban, and rural populations, are its United States Representative, Robin Kelly, Cook County 6th District Commissioner Donna Miller, Mantino Mayor Timothy Nugent, who's also President of the Economic Alliance of Kankakee County, and Chicago 10th Ward Alderwoman Susan Garza. Moderating the discussion is accomplished Chicago journalist Laura Washington. Why is it important that we find common ground in 
government and politics. Uh, Representative Kelly. Well, I think the federal government is a good example of what happens when you don't find common ground that is very hard to pass any type of legislation. We've passed things in the House and maybe we've passed them in a bipartisan way in the House, but we cannot get them called in the Senate. So we haven't been able to make you know, a whole lot of progress. So this week, why we had to all, you know, we all came back and we're hoping that um, we can rise above that and uh, have a COVID stimulus, which I know my commissioner, my mayor, and my alderwoman all want. We're all in this together and we can prosper as a region a lot better than we can individually. Uh, you know, when we've been able to, you know, work cooperatively to uh, bring businesses to town, uh, it, you know, everybody, the, a new business comes to town, uh, they might locate in one community, but the people live and work and spend money in a variety of communities. And I, and I think that, you know, the regionalism uh, idea, you know, is something that we all need to accept. But if we're all sitting in our own, you know, village halls or city council, and, and we're not talking to the people next door, and we're trying to steal business from one to the other, uh, I think it's, you know, it, we all suffer. Uh, I think, you know, I'd say we you know, when we work together, I think we work better. And I think we've got a lot of success stories to prove that. With the smaller municipalities that share, you know, uh, fire departments or parks or just different programs, they f it, it's cheaper to work together. You know, I worked for the village of Madison for 13 years. And I know that, you know, we did the fire for Olympia Fields. It was more reasonable for Olympia Fields to do that than have their own fire department. The whole issue about pet coke. It was in 2015 and um, Robin actually helped us, you know, write legislation to ban and actually Mayor Emanuel got on board with it as well. But um, Senator Durbin and um, Congresswoman Kelly were instrumental in helping us ban um, the storage and use of pet coke. And that was a game changer for us. So that was something that I consider to be a huge win. We've got a community in the Kentucky County that's very poor, uh, a community called Hopkins Park, Pembroke. Um, they didn't have any Wi-Fi out there, and the congresswoman uh, had a company that was willing to erect a couple towers, but uh, they needed someone in the local community to be able to pay some monthly bills and be, you know be able to uh, you know make sure that you know everything you know ran smoothly after the uh, Wi-Fi got installed. Uh, so her office called you know, my office here in Kankakee. Uh, we were able to get a couple of the local banks and hospitals to agree to uh, work with the congresswoman to, you know, to be able to take care of the monthly expenses. Uh, and as a result, we were you know, able to erect a, a tower out there and you know, make sure that the area had Wi-Fi, at least at their library. It's really been an, a great example of collaboration when we see what's happened with the CARES funding that came from the federal government, came to the county, came to the city of Chicago, and then got dispersed through the municipalities um, through, through Cook County. I'm only speaking about Cook County. But that collaboration took knowledge on each person's uh, level of government to understand what's happening there. Congresswoman Kelly is intimately involved in all the municipalities in her district to know what the needs are, what the gaps were, and there's still a lot of gaps. And I know that's why she's there right now fighting to make sure we can get more funding, which would be one of the biggest obstacles, the, the lack of um, initial funding. But I think that Cook County has done a really good job on partnering where it's possible and getting funding where it's possible. Mm -hmm. And the Southland Development Authority is 45 different municipalities in Southern Cook County, um, suburban Cook County, focused on economic development. So funding comes from different um, public-private partnerships, as well as funding from the federal government, as well as other funding from businesses. And that is all to go to the mayor's point of boosting the region. And it's not to say that one would you know, always get preference, but whatever happens in one area benefits other areas. And that's the goal of the SDA is to make sure that they're looked at as a whole unit because of the size of the city of Chicago. When you put 45 municipalities together, it equals the size of the city of Chicago. So if they acted as one entity mm -hmm. then they can compete as one entity instead of 45 to bring businesses. People tend to put one broad brush on the South suburbs. So, and sometimes the brush is not very 
good. And even though we have so many things, you know, going for ourselves and everybody's not, you know, uneducated or poor, that, that's what I find. Like we can afford, um, you know, Lord and Taylor or whoever, just like everybody else. But mm -hmm. sometimes that's not the brush, you know, put on. Or if you go uh, further down and get more rural, the attitudes, you know, that people have. I know when I was first selected, I, I felt like my farmers were like, oh my God, who is going to be representing us? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, did you, I mean, did you actually hear those comments or? or yeah, just, yeah, from yeah, some of them, yeah. but I have a very, yeah. very good relationship with my farmers. They just gave me two, recognized me with two awards. Those mean the absolute most to me, because I know most of them are not Democrat and uh, no, I have a great relation. I have a, uh, I call it a barn hall meeting every summer. We couldn't do it this summer because of COVID. And some of them, they come and give me a hard time. They don't like, you know, some of the things, but we listen and, you know, communicate. We have success because we are close to the city. Uh, you know, we want to, uh, you know, to commingle ourselves with the, uh, you know, the Cook County and the city area because uh, you know, that's where, you know, we have so many people that could potentially help our workforce or that, uh, you know, that could, uh, you could make our area you know, successful. Um, so, you know, the, you know, the idea that we all have to be, you know, be on the same page on every issue, I don't think, that, you know, that that's not the case. Uh, I just think we have to be able to respect everybody and be able to be smart enough to, uh, to talk to people, to uh, realize there's going to be differing, op differing opinions, that there's going to be different cultures, different ways that people were brought up. So naturally they're gonna think different. Uh, I think Robin talked earlier about, you know, that the you know, South suburbs gets painted with a broad brush. And I think that's the same with the rural communities. Uh, you know, we've got farmers in, in, you know, that are very educated, uh, highly sophisticated operations, but uh, you know, people, you know, from the city don't necessarily know the millions of dollars that they might have invested in their operation. Mm -hmm. We've got people at the coffee shops in our small communities here uh, that paint everybody in the city, you know, uh, bad because of what they saw in the news the night before. We've got to be smart enough to see through that and realize that you know that, that, that those are you know uh, individual cases, and that's not the broad brush. We had a lot of protest um, in suburban Cook County, which was not you know common, or what people weren't used to it. They were wondering were these outside people, and a lot of them were not outside people. They were the youth. From those communities, there was a big one in Oak Forest. They never had anything like that before. Mm -hmm. And to see that young people who live in those communities, whether you know they're in suburban Cook County, they're not city of Chicago, they might not go to Chicago all the time, but they care about that issue of equity, of, of fairness, and they wanted to use their voices to, to make that heard, and, and they got organized. And so mm -hmm. it really showed how um, the issues might be, you know, diverse across, you know, portions of Chicago might have been highlighted as this is where it's happening, but it was also happening in smaller communities. When you get elected mayor or whatever job you get elected to, there's, you know, there, there's not like a, a school you go to and, you know, here's all the right things to do and here's the bad things to do. Uh, you kind of learn by fire and, uh, you know, and, you know, you, you got the most votes, but you might not have the messed up, most knowledge on everybody or everything that's going on in your community. Uh, so I think that, you know, we need to make sure that there's a lot of smart people in the room uh, and pay mm -hmm. attention to them and listen to them. We're privileged to a lot of background information that the average Joe doesn't have, right? And um, I try really hard to bring people into the mix, um, constituents, my staff when decisions are being made, people that are activists, right? I was an activist before I became an alderman. And Certainly were. It, yes, I was. And <laughs> there's a big difference, right? I mean, you can be an activist and, and advocate for your community, which I, I do and I will continue to do, but there's a difference between being an activist and a legislator. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to compromise. You have to be able to talk to people around the table that it affects. And, and I don't know everything about everything. Tim's right. You have to bring people in that know about that issue. I think that, you know, the, the TIF issue is one that uh, most of the people that are totally against it probably don't understand it. I mean, unless you deal with that on a daily basis and you're involved heavily with that, uh, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, why would the normal guy who's going to work every day understand how TIF operates? 
but TIF is a tool in our toolbox that, you know, that we have to have if we're going to be able to attract certain businesses or be able to uh, invest in some of the businesses that we have here. I said earlier, I border the another state. I border Indiana. I could walk six blocks to the east and be in um, Hammond, Indiana, and it's exploding with development there. Mm-hmm. If we don't use incentives to bring people to the city of Chicago, I wouldn't, we, nobody would come because they could go six blocks to the east and get the same demographic. Because my district is so diverse, um, sometimes some groups have gotten on my case because I voted, you know, for something, but it was good for 90% of my district, but then the 10%, you know, was very upset with me. I have a um, Latino task force and I can't remember what it was exactly, but we just met not too long ago. And, and there was something I voted on that some of them did not appreciate because it left some things out that, you know, they wanted, but for right now, it was really the best that we could do. And if we held out completely, then a lot of people would lose. What concerns that you, you do you have going forward, knowing that maybe the census wasn't as adequate as it should have been, it's going to control a portion apportionment in the future. What are your what do you have any concerns about that, or and what what should we be looking at or be, or be focusing on as we move forward? Illinois has lost a lot of people, and right. we know that the maps are going to be different. We think we're going to lose one congressional seat, and if people don't didn't fill it out like they should have, it could be two. So that's two less voices on, you know, some powerful committees, you know, so that's our concern. Um, The count, is there enough time to really make sure, you know, that everything uh, is like it's supposed to be and that, you know, as the, um, you know, the remapping is done, that it is, you know, accurate. The census got lost in so many things. It got lost in COVID. It got lost in the civil uprising. It you know, it, I was really hoping for that extension to go to the end of October, but that didn't come. Um, it's, it's actually kind of scary to think about the, the outcome of this because it, so many things depend on it. And I think we are going to see some significant remaps um, because of loss of numbers. Uh, we did everything we could in our ward. We had census outreach programs. I mean, I know Congresswoman Kelly came, Commissioner Moore came. I, we did everything. We knocked doors. We, and you know, there were still people that just didn't fill it out. I, mm-hmm. they didn't understand the magnitude of what this means. And I, I think we're gonna see, we're gonna feel the repercussions when the the final numbers come out. And I do expect um, that we're gonna Chicago is proper is gonna lose people. I, I there's not a doubt in my mind. How do you think it will affect the, the city council? Do you have any insights into in the terms of how that? I think re-tackles? there's going to be. I think there's going to be some significant remaps. I, you know, there people are already starting to talk about it. I, nobody knows what that looks like right now. Um, this administration has never been through a remap, um, so you know, it's kind of like I've been talking to people that have been there. It's like, well, this is how we did it last time, but we don't know how it's going to work this time. So I think it's just going to be a new frontier for everyone. My family's lived in Cook County for a hundred years. And when you look at what that means from a racial standpoint, um, economic standpoint, and um, how groups like this need to reach back and um, we have to develop the bench, if you will, be it our young people who can, you know, take our area into what the, the next generation looks like. And so, I mean, I think panels like this are great. But I also think that we need to have younger, you know, uh, leaders or even students talk about what they envision. Because the other big thing that happens in Illinois is we lose our young people. They go to school here and then they leave. So we don't want them to leave. We want to keep our own institutional knowledge um, right here in our communities, whether it's Kankakee, Linwood, Chicago, keep them here. So how can we give them incentive to stay here, use their talent here uh, to build for the next, for the future. We thank our distinguished panelists and moderator for that illuminating discussion. The second of our interconnected cultural interludes features someone who, like his late friend A.C. Reed, is a saxophonist from rural southern Illinois who achieved success in Chicago, but did so by way of a different path. 
Terry Ogolini grew up in the 1950s and 60s in an Italian-American family in the coal mining town of Dowell, population 500 in northeastern Jackson County. His father taught his older brother the accordion and prompted Terry to learn the clarinet at age five. The brothers performed polkas, waltzes, country songs, and pop standards during fish fries at their family's tavern. In high school and college, Terry played tenor sax with various musicians in Southern Illinois. Eventually, he and guitarist Pete Special teamed up with Larry Big Twist Nolan, an African-American rhythm and blues singer based in Murfreesboro. In the mid-1970s, Big Twist and the Mellow Fellows performed almost nightly at taverns in rural coal belt communities such as Culp and Buckner, as well as Carbondale, where they developed an enthusiastic following among Southern Illinois University students. After a few years, they concluded that they'd reached the limit of professional opportunities available to them locally. Terry Ogolini picks up the story there. Me and Pete and Twist were sitting in PK's one night, just sitting in the bar and uh, talking about this exact, uh, exact idea that if we don't leave here, we're never going to uh, amount to anything else. We're never going to get a recording contract here. And we all decided right then and there that you go home, we'll go home, we'll pack up our stuff and we'll leave town. And we literally left the bar, went home, packed up our bags, grabbed our instruments and stuff, twist came back from Murphy's Road to Carbondale, picked me and Pete up, and we moved to Chicago. That's how we moved. It was literally that quick. People loved twists wherever we went, wherever we went. I don't care if it was Buckner or the north side of Chicago. You know, twist had that charisma, a great singer, a great vocalist, um, a great front man. The club owners in Chicago, they knew for a fact, we hired Twist, we got a full house. We played umpteen jobs with B.B. King, <clears throat> Albert King, Muddy, Muddy Waters, uh, Bobby Bland. All of those people was our idols. Wherever we went, it didn't matter where we were, what country or whatever, People would be out there going, S-I-U, S-I-U. Some people would hold up huge banners from the balcony going, S-I-U remembers twist and stuff. You know, it's just, it just floored me, you know? From a bar room at the Veterans Inn and Dow <laughs> to a stage at Grant Park, you know, with thousands and thousands of people out in the audience is really a... Uh, it's really a, a trip, you know? And not a head trip, a real trip. <laughs> Let's hear a performance by Big Twist and the Mellow Fellows that accentuates their connections with both their professional base in Cook County and their personal roots in Jackson County, more than 300 miles southwest. From their 1987 Alligator Records album, Live from Chicago, here's an original composition called I'm Coming Home.
Whether they're at home in Dal or Dalton, Buckner or Bucktown, Illinoisans throughout our state regularly encounter manifestations of the relationship between population distribution and the allocation of political power and public resources. With us for a wide-ranging conversation about current issues involving that relationship are two journalists based in communities in Cook County. Michael Romaine, editor of the Austin Weekly News on Chicago's West Side and publisher of the Village Free Press, which covers several near West suburbs, and Jackie Serrato, editor-in-chief of the South Side Weekly, serving Chicago neighborhoods south of Roosevelt Road. Joining them to provide a statewide perspective is Hannah Meisel, state government and politics reporter with NPR Illinois in Springfield. You know, one of the things that's rocked Illinois politics and government in the last two years is this big federal investigation that's kind of nabbed a lot of uh, Democratic power brokers. Arguably the biggest is the one that centers around uh, longtime House Speaker McNadigan and his inner circle. And of course, um, you know, Madigan kind of represents this very old school Chicago machine politics, um, you know, that you uh, gain votes uh, because you dole out jobs and contracts and, you know, you help out those in your own neighborhood. And of course, the neighborhood that he uh, is from is on Chicago's Southwest side, um, you know, white Irish enclave uh, started out that way, but, you know, in recent decades has, um, you know, become home to a lot of uh, Latinos. And, you know, you see that uh, kind of that struggle of, um, you know, folks who want to stay in power, but also understand that, you know, they have to share power uh, in order to kind of maintain their own power. But you see it on a more, you know, a human level of uh, unequal distribution of resources um, in and around that district. You know, I think that this probe, fairly or not, represents a lot of things that folks, especially downstate, have felt for decades. And, you know, the, the cartoonish line is, oh, the Chicago Democrats control everything and uh, folks downstate are forgotten, um, which to an extent is true, but it's, it's obviously far more nuanced than that. And, um, you know, Democrats south of I-80 have been uh, kind of a disappearing species, that uh, classic blue dog Democrat downstate. And then you also have a disappearing species of moderate Republicans in the Chicago suburbs. I don't necessarily think it means anything good for the state when people uh, refuse to talk to each other and understand each other. We decided to, you know, just explore um, what are the different definitions and understandings that people have around defunding the police from abolition all the way to the reallocation of resources? You know, what is the perspective from the nonprofit sector? Um, how do the young people, um, how do they reimagine their future with less police or without police? Um, and it, it's just been very interesting to get submissions from all sorts of residents uh, in the South Side, which if you're familiar with Chicago South Side, it's, uh, you know, a, a part of the city that is majority uh, black and brown immigrant um, and working class. During um, the civil unrest over the, the spring and summer, um, we were very persistent in fact checking the statements released by, by the Chicago Police Department, um, you know, where they were, would claim that you know, the young people were the aggressors. We collected photos and video of a lot of these um, clashes and altercations with Chicago police. And, you know, we found that many times it was the police who, who were instigating um, the violence. So we were working with Injustice Watch um, to put out a voter guide around Cook County judges. However, when, when those newspapers arrived to Cook County Jail, they were sent back and they were deemed contraband. The communities that are, I cover, the inner ring suburbs like Maywood, Bellwood, predominantly black, and uh, west side communities like Austin and North Lawndale and West Garfield Park uh, traditionally have been cut out of, um, of investment. Uh, and, and the lack of investment, the lack of systemic investment, um, both on the state and the city level is reflected in how those communities look. And so the Illinois Black Caucus has been 
on a, a tear. They they've gotten they 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 have a renewed sense of unity going into the veto session that has since been extended. Um, it was supposed to start, I believe, in November. Um, and they're going with a, a set of demands um, and um, a set of priorities that are deeply rooted in racial equity. Uh, and the main thing that, the, and, and a lot of these lawmakers, black lawmakers, um, two of which uh, are two of which are, who are leading leading the effort, um, Chris Welch, who is um, chairing the, the committee that's investigating Madigan. Uh, who's a uh, lawmaker in suburban hillside, which is uh, a community that's covered by Village Free Press, and um, Kimberly Lightford, who's the Senate Majority Leader, and she's the chair of the Illinois Black House Caucus, uh, the uh, Black Caucus. They um they're leading that effort um, among the leadership in that effort, and uh, I've interviewed both of them, and what they tell me is that they they're deeply hurt, um, and they're taking the hurt that they've experienced from white lawmakers, a lot of lawmakers downstate who um, looked at their proposals in the past and had didn't want to hear them, um, who looked at their um, talk of racial equity and ignored it. <laughs> I mean, so this, this is going to be a really, really tense um, um, legislative session coming up. And, and, and we'll see how serious the state is about, about racial equity and parity. There was definitely um, a lot of hesitation I would say from people to participate in the census. Um, and I think a lot of it was uh, very much affected by COVID-19. Um, uh, and I can speak for the Latinx community, the Latino community, uh, which especially right now under Trump where, you know, Mexicans and Latino people have been, you know, attacked uh, constantly and consistently, um, you know, there's just been a lot of hesitation to simply open the door to somebody that you don't know. What this is going to mean for the redistricting of, of our congressional districts and um, the, the remapping of the wards, um, I think we're going to see less representation in communities that are already um, underrepresented. Asian and South Asian voters are a previously, I guess you could say, untapped um, political power and they are growing. I mean, in the Chicago suburbs, you have Congressman Raja Krishna Murthy and you have um, a few South Asian uh, folks represented at other levels of government in Illinois, but um, that's, a, that's a population that um, people were hoping to get more participation out of uh, the census, which would then translate to political representation and um, more resource allocation. But, you know, because of COVID, like everything else, um, you know, it, it, you have an unequal, um, you know, distribution of uh, folks who were able to be reached, especially because so many language barriers exist. The city of Chicago is full of essential workers and also people of color. And because of, of those two reasons, we have some of the highest rates of COVID-19. Lives lost, opportunities lost, people who are struggling you know, to pay the rent, to pay the mortgage. Um, and we've seen no relief you know, whatsoever um, you know, from our mayor and very little relief from our governor. Um, however, at the end of the day, we are the people that make the city run. Um, so I think we really need to evaluate, you know, our moral compass, uh, who are the people that we value in the city and in this, and in this uh, state. Um, and if we truly value them, if, if they are that crucial to our economy, then we need to show it. The people that I cover uh, on the west side and in the west suburbs would, you know, would probably say, um, you know, we have a lot more in common with people in downstate rural communities than either of us may even think on the surface uh, because communities downstate have been neglected as well, just as communities on the west side of Chicago have been neglected. Um, they've been neglected in different ways. You know, these communities have been neglected by Democrats and Republicans. It's not a Democratic or a Republican issue. It's, it's an issue of 
you know, um, uh, a certain sector of society, um, you know, non-college educated, um, blue collar essential workers, um, non-managerial, um, non-professional classes of people um, who, you know, didn't go to the east or the west coast or to the loop to work, you know, didn't decide to lead their communities, but stayed there. These are people, you know, who have been neglected. And if we just join forces um, on common issues, um, we would stand a lot better chance of our interests being reflected in Springfield and even in Washington. Our deep gratitude to Hannah Mizell, Jackie Serrato, and Michael Romain for helping us understand a little bit about how the distribution of power and resources are affecting us here and now. We're gonna hear the last installment of this cultural trilogy in just a moment. But first I wanna thank with deep appreciation our supporters. This program is part of the Democracy and Informed Citizen Initiative administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils. The initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge and appreciation of the vital connections between democracy, the humanities, journalism, and an informed citizenry. I also want to thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their generous support of this particular program, the initiative, and the Pulitzer Prizes for their partnership. And I have to give a shout out to our very own Illinois Grand Victoria Foundation, the Illinois Arts Council, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. I also want to thank all of you for joining us tonight and for supporting our work. It's really important to invest in the humanities and give us a chance to be together and think about the kinds of issues and concerns that really remind us of our own humanity and the things we share. I want to thank all of the guests who appeared in this evening's program and who shared their insights really helps us understand each other in different parts of the state. Want to give a special shout out to the person who produced tonight's program, Brian Schrage of Edwardsville and Baldwin Media Development of El Dorado. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us and participating in this conversation and helping us close our 2020 programming series. We at Illinois Humanities hope you all have a healthy and peaceful holiday season. And now here's Matt Meacham to close out our program. Our last interconnected cultural interlude, or technically postlude, features poetry by James Ballou. Like Terry Ogolini, Dr. Ballou was raised in the heart of the Southern Illinois Coal Belt, having grown up in Heron, and has performed as a jazz instrumentalist. He taught literature and writing at Bradley University in Peoria for 36 years and now lives in Chicago. His writings about the cultural complexity of Illinois were among the inspirations for this program series, so we're honored to share some of them with you. Jim will read two poems about literal and metaphorical landscapes. The first, Illinois Coalscapes, has three sections, the pits, the strips, and the towns. The second poem, The Prairie and the Lake, reflects upon his experiences in central Illinois and in Chicago. The Pits. Farmers of the black vegetable reap fields below the earth into which years later city streets sag and heaps flag like cobs high into the air and let it burn with a blue flame through an eternity. Or, if incombustible, make of it mountains to climb, rugged barren heights to whet the imagination of their children, and leave skeletal structures to remind themselves that their work is done. The Strips. From New Coin to Farmington, craters appear, crawling with monsters which gnaw at the earth incessantly. Rims gray, emerald water fills the basins. Our father's work is planted over. Pine forests, ring waters, suddenly ripe with fish the fruits of their labor. 
the town. Houses balloon one rising like another until incorporated they become a town about which tipples fill the air. Exhausted arteries harden. Persistent folk hold on for the Chamber of Commerce to import enterprises for their labor. They tend their gardens. But Paul Scarlet will not do for one. Sweet William will. The prairie and the lake. We have explored the prairie, or what is left of it. The flowing fields of grass, the bordering woods, diminished by seasonal plots of grain and corn, defined by geometrical economies of our design. We have known limitless skies, sunsets, stars, assuring us that we are not alone. The rising of moons of different shapes and colors, their moods, their myth-making, our dependence on their rising. Now we have come to explore the shore of a great lake, a place that defies geometry, a flowing expanse to inspire the eye, bordering woods, parks, and a city that shelters a universe of creatures with whom we share the pleasures of these changing skies, these seasons.